All right, we're very happy to have uh, Ken Wharton today visiting us to give our IQS seminar. Uh, so Ken did his bachelor's of science at Stanford and his PhD at UCLA. He's a professor at San Jose State University, uh, but he's now living in the LA area and will start uh, physically commuting in the fall to teach his classes there. But in the meantime, having a great time doing research on quantum foundation. So we're very happy to have Ken join us and tell us about his work. Ken is maybe best known for his retrocausal theories of quantum mechanics, but today he's going to tell us about uh, universal hidden variables for quantum circuits. Oh, it's all the same thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is kind of a, a uh, in progress talk, but uh, there's been enough exciting progress that uh, I thought I'd come to, to somewhere where where such things are not viewed as totally impossible and tell you uh, just, just how close things are looking to, um, to what, uh, what I think is going to be the next big thing in, uh, there it is, in uh, quantum foundation. So I'm going to, what I normally do is spend like the whole time just trying to motivate that no, this isn't impossible. Um, and I'm just going to try to spend five or 10 minutes on, on the motivation and get get to the heart of what I've been working on really for the last 10 years. Um, and I've never given a talk on this for 10 years. So it's time, I'm excited about this. Uh, most of the framework was all done as of like six or seven years ago. And but uh, I'm gonna, I wanna go through it. I wanna show you guys, it's not, it's not terrible. You, you'll recognize most of it and it'll seem mostly familiar. And then I get to the new stuff, the, the new results. And um, tell you tell you what what I've been doing uh, lately with my uh, teaching online. I've had a lot more research time lately. Uh, but anyway, I, let's get to the motivation of this, which is that quantum states are crazy big, right? Uh, you get even just like a, a mere uh, thousand uh, spin states together, and you're talking about something that requires more complex numbers than particles in the universe to describe. Uh, doesn't seem particularly fundamental. And I'm gonna just mo try to motivate this by just pointing out it's not really necessary either because we can describe every possible quantum state of n, uh, n qubits in the quantum circuit formalism, right? We can all, what do we need here? We need like n order n numbers on the way in and we need order n squared gates and presto, we've just compressed this giant, crazy quantum state down to order n squared. Um, so it can be done, right? And the, the problem, uh, why like nobody treats this as a compressed description of this massive quantum state is, um, well, okay, so if you, if you did what you would want, the ideal goal here, is that instead of having a giant two to the n quantum state, you would just have some, some state on this qubit here. The Q, here, I, this is foreshadowing what's coming next. These are eight real numbers that live on, on, this, on this qubit here, and eight real numbers live on this qubit here, and another eight numbers live on this qubit. But the idea is it doesn't have to scale exponentially. Every time you add one more qubit, you just add one more uh, piece of information. Uh, equivalent to all the others. Now, of course, as you pass through these gates, it's going to change. So, you know, the eight numbers you need down at this part of the qubit are different from the eight numbers you need here. But the idea, the goal is, why don't we look for an ontology that lives on the qubits locally and only interacts where they come together? So that's that's the dream. And so we're all on the same page. What did Q and P represent? Yeah, that's coming. That is just foreshadowing. Okay. That's something, some ontology. Uh, okay. Some ontology living, living on the cube. Okay, so why can't we do this? Well, we can't do this in everyone's mind because Bell's theorem says we can't have nice things. <laughs> and Nathan's here. And so Nathan and I wrote this, this big, massive uh, analysis of all this and uh, pointed out that, it, okay, you, people say, oh, we can't have uh, P's and Q's uh, that live in space time here because that would be like Bell's theorem variables. And those are ruled out by Bell's theorem. There's no, there's no model that, that will allow. But of course, most people here at Chapman uh, have heard all about uh, the loophole that is going to allow us to get back into space-time, which is instead of solving it like a, uh, a 
computer, you solve this whole circuit all at once as a big space-time problem that's all interconnected. And specifically, the way this works is if I change my measurement setting, if I like added a, a unitary gate here to measure it in a different basis, when I, I have to solve it all over again. I can't just like tweak what happens to the, to the outcome. I have to go back to basics, look, analyze the entire circuit from scratch and find, okay, well, now they're gonna be different hidden variables here. Oh, and those impact this gate and that impacts this gate. And so actually all the hidden variables change. So you have to solve it all over again, simply by changing the measurement basis, uh, which is a little annoying, but that you start to see why the conventional wave function is so enormous. It has to handle every possible thing you could do to this state. That's why these states are exponential, not because there's even anything exponential that comes out, right? What comes out of this is just n bits of, of data from, from your result. So you don't have anything exponentially big in the description, in the input, in the output. Uh, it's all hiding in the math. There's something exponentially complicated in the calculation, sure, but it doesn't have to be exponentially big in the ontology. So that's the motivation. The motivation is let's get uh, a reality back on the qubits on, on space time. Uh, why would we want to do this? Well, obviously our state space would shrink by just, you can't even, you can't even, I can't even really comprehend how much smaller the space space would be by the time you're talking about any reasonable number of qubits. The events aren't living in Hilbert space, they're, they're in space time, right? I have some events on this, this qubit wire, which is some path in space time. And as long as all those paths are slower than light or light speed, you're back to hoping to get Lorentz covariance uh, back to your ontology. Um, our instincts about locality, that things should only interact when they come physically come together, could be restored. There's none of this, this action and distance stuff. And this idea of a collapse now starts to update our knowledge. When we are learning something about a hidden variable, any hidden variable theory, uh, as soon as you measure something, you, you update your knowledge. And so by having hidden variables live on these qubits, you don't need uh, a true ontological collapse, uh, except in the sense that, well, one sense we'll talk about. I'd love to restore time symmetry uh, to all this. Uh, that's also part of getting rid of the, the bad part of the blast. So I see all those as benefits. I think what people see as, what they'll say is the worst disadvantage is that, oh no, but it's retrocausal, right? Because I changed, I changed some future gate and all of a sudden the past is different. And okay, yeah, our instinct, if this were right, our instincts about time would be wrong. Our instincts about time, how time and causality are related would be wrong. But we already know our instincts about time are wrong in a number of other ways, thanks to Einstein and others. Um, so this is one more way our instincts about time would be wrong. Okay, that's a disadvantage. Um, one really short-sighted disadvantage is to say, oh, Ken, your, your single qubits, they need eight real numbers, that's crazy. Why would we want anything that complicated? Uh, let's go down to, you know, one or two. Um, but that's really short-sighted. If, if the benefit is to get a simpler uh, entangled description, by the time you get to three or four or a million qubits, uh, it's really short-sighted to say, oh, your single qubit's more complicated, so I'm not, I'm not interested. Um, so those are some possible objections and disadvantages. But really what I think, the reason people who know this is possible haven't been working on this, is how do you work on it? I can say, well, there might be a hidden variable model, but without an actual description of a working model, um, where do you go, right? You can't, it's like in the 19th century, if you said, I don't think heat is really fundamental. I wanna build up something it's based on underneath. Well, what do you do, right? You, you can't like, you can't do uh, inductive reasoning to figure out what the hidden underlying model is. You have to guess it and see if it works. And you know, people guess atoms and atoms, atoms work for heat and entropy and stuff like that. So we need a guess, we need a good guess. And so that's what I've been doing in my career is coming up with a lot of guesses and finding out most of them don't work. But um, today I'm here to talk about one that, one that seems to work pretty well. So uh, that's why I wanna spend all the time talking about the working model or the almost working model and, um, and not about the motivation. But uh, if we got people in the audience here who are convinced all this is impossible and no, you can't, you can't hope, there's no way you get back to space time, 
Um, maybe I should pause here and see if there are questions in um, in Zoom land or or in person here and see if if I have any any complaints or questions about my motivation or what I'm trying to do here. But what I'm trying to do is get reality back on the on the cubic wires. So I, I guess the, the preface to the first disadvantage bullet is that it is a retrocausal model. It is a retrocausal model. And I mean, depending on what you mean by retrocausal, but people, some people don't even know really what that means or think of things falling back in time. But what I mean by it is explicitly this, that you add a gate in the future and when you resolve it, you get different answers in the past. That is formally, I mean, nothing's flowing back in time here, right? Uh, nothing is, is, you're not changing the past. This is one universe, this is another universe. This is one circuit you run, there's another circuit you run. Um, it's, it's retrocausal in the model. It's not like things aren't flowing backward in time. Or that doesn't even make any sense. Um, that's, that's, that is the, the, the conceptual reason why people don't like to go there. Um, so, yes? Quick question. Would you consider, based on this reasoning, a smooth model or a smooth estimate of a stochastic process to be a retrocausal model? Okay, so. There's, uh, let's have this discussion of what stochastic even means in a time neutral sense. Because uh, we all know what stochastic means in a like, forward computational sense. Uh, in all one sense, the word stochastic, I don't know what that means. You, we talked on email a bit about that. So let's talk to them. That's why um, I said estimate rather than the ontology. Okay. Um, okay. So how things appear, how things appear is. Um, it's going to come up here, right? Well, what, what do we think is going on versus what is really going on? So, uh, okay, so I try, I'm trying to build a model and I have my certain ideas of what things should look like. But the very first thing here is I'm going to be dealing with a lot of two by two matrices, but I'm not going to tensor product them together. Tensor producting is the path to madness, right? It's, <laughs> it's the path to these exponential giant states. You, uh, there is no tensor product in any of this. Everything is localized. You've got a two by two matrix on one qubit, it's there. It's not tensor product with another one. Um, I really want an action based story because all of our best physics that is all at once are action stories. They're of the Lagrangian based, they're, they're things that are integrated over time uh, and done over time rather than done as, as states. So, I, whatever states I have, I want them to have a Lagrangian uh, formulation. Um, the other thing that really bugged me is that qubits are everywhere, right? Anything can be a qubit. As long as you have a two level quantum system, you can treat it as a qubit. And what sort of fundamental model would be as generic as that, that would just show up absolutely everywhere. And so I have an answer to that, but I want these, these decisions I make in the model building to be as simple and generic as possible so that there's a chance that they really might show up. Um, what do we know about single qubits? Well, we know the, the group symmetry. We know the, uh, this SU2, and that's going to be crucial in, in building all this. <clears throat> One thing that doesn't really bother people, maybe it should, is that the mathematics we use in quantum mechanics distinguishes between states and gates. Um, and I'm going to basically present something where every it's a closed algebra all around. Your state and your gates are the same sort of mathematical structures. Not like you have one sort of matrix for your operator and one sort of matrix for your, your density matrix or something. Uh, I, I, want, I want it all to be simple. I want it all to be the same sort of thing. Um, something that down the road, I'm gonna like not give this talk talking about what's happening continuously at the lowest level, but here we're talking about ontology. So I, I need a story of what's happening on these wires and through these gates as a, as a function of time, as a continuous evolution. But of course, effectively, we want to get to the quantum information, quantum computing description. It has to be effectively discrete. So I'm going to show you the continuous story and the discrete story. But the discrete story emerges from the continuous story, right? You, you run the continuous story at the lowest level, and you say, oh, but effectively, when you run through the gate, that's this discrete transformation. So I'm going to do both of those. Um, ideally, I want this to be time symmetric in, in the way I see time symmetry. We can talk about that. And where I want probabilities to come out is that 
there should be probability. If you're doing an all at once analysis of the circuit, we got to do an all at once analysis of probabilities. And that means joint probabilities, not you can get conditional probabilities of given the past, what's probably the future. If you have the joint probabilities between you know, the past, future, joint probability. But uh, anytime you're looking at something all at once, you're not looking for the Born rule directly. You're looking to get the Born rule out of an all at once viewpoint. And so I'll show you sort of some ways that that, that probably will, will come out. Of this. Um, so those are that's all my sort of background thinking of, of how how to try to build this. And um, now I'm going to show you what I did. But first, oh wait, oh my my hardest learned lesson, and this I have to beat this out of my brain, is that I'm so used to normalizing states. You know we all are, um, but the reason we normalize states is to normalize probabilities. And in a new model, you don't want to normalize anything except probabilities, right? Probabilities get normalized for free and nothing else should be normalized until you know what the probability rule is. So I keep having to learn this lesson over and over again. Uh, don't normalize things that aren't probable. Okay, <clears throat> math. Um, so we know that this SU2 group has all sorts of different representations. One representation is this unit quaternion or pointed on the three sphere, but the ones you're familiar with as, as quantum physicists is, are these uh, a single cubic gates. Um, now, not all unitary matrices are, group, are members of, of SU2, but those you can always put a global phase on any unitary matrix, a two by two unitary matrix, uh, make the determinant equal to one. And when you do that, uh, you can transform any unitary matrix to a member of this SU2 group. And written in terms of the two by two poly matrices, it looks like this. So any um, two by two matrix that's a member of SU2 is gonna have an identity portion. It's gonna have a portion that looks like negative I times each of the three poly matrices. And so A, B, C, and D are just real coefficients times each of these four matrices. This also is a quaternion. Um, and if you don't know anything about quaternions, you do because you know about poly matrices. Um, but they are the, you know, the same non commutative geometry or uh, algebra. It's closed algebra. You don't apply any two quaternions, you get another quaternion. And every time you see a bold symbol in, um, in the rest of the talk, it is one of these two by two matrices of this form. And we don't do a lot in quantum mechanics with stuff of this form except for these two by two unitary gates. Uh, and even then, we have this phase that we ignore that is important, actually. Uh, to get it in this form. But when you see Q show up here, all that means is it's a special two by two matrix. If you want the visual, it's, um, it's the top row, right? Any two by two complex matrix, you can decompose into these eight pieces. I only want it to be a superposition or a sum, let's not call superposition, a sum of these four basic matrices, not the other four. I do think, well, I, Got too much to talk about. I'll tell you where the other four might come in, depending on how. Okay. Given that, the notation should be very familiar because when you Hermitian conjugate any of these four matrices, that's equivalent to not changing the sign of the first one and changing the sign of the other three. Um, and so, uh, her, if you know about quaternions and you conjugate those, it's identical to Hermitian conjugation of these two by two matrices. Uh, we can talk about the real part which is basically the, the identity part. Um, but you just, it's for the quaternion, you just take, you know, the first term is the real one. Uh, you can also talk about the imaginary part, which is a vector, which is the other three parts. Um, and if you subtract its conjugate and divide by two, you get basically these three parts. That's, it's not really imaginary if written out as a matrix, but in the quaternion, that's the imaginary part of the quaternion. So that is a three vector. Um, and it, it, the components are I times the poly matrices. <clears throat> uh, you can do norm squareds and get magnitudes. Um, normally, the order of operation matters for quaternions and matrices, but not for this case. You just get basically a real positive number when you do this, this key square. So all of this should be pretty familiar. Um, maybe not thinking about the imaginary part of the matrix. But uh, other than that, this if you've done anything with two by two matrices, this this should be, you, you should understand my notation. Okay, 
Now, we got some problems. I've talked about how to map a gate to a quaternion, but how about single qubit space or you know, to these matrices? Um, I've written a whole paper on this, but basically the easiest way to do it that you're probably familiar with is a density matrix. So a density matrix is not of the form I described, right? Because it doesn't have an I here. Um, but if you have a block ball vector V, you can write it almost like what I have. And so you can now motivate this. Well, why don't we just add an I to that second term and maybe turn the one half of the identity matrix into some other unknown parameter, a hidden, hidden, hidden variable. Um, this doesn't quite work. It turns out this is not the right ontology, but it is something related to uh, what I'm going to show you in a moment. Um, but keep, do keep that in mind that, that you could easily take a row and turn it into one of my two by two matrices simply by multiplying this, this part by I and then or negative I and then boom, you got, you got it in the right form. <clears throat> okay, that's all background. What is my ontology? My ontology is Harmonic Oscillator. It's, remember, it's gotta, be, it's gotta be ubiquitous, it's gotta be everywhere. So here, this is what's going on on my qubit wires, is one of these matrices is obeying a harmonic oscillator equation. Um, the most simple, basic classical physics equation you have uh, and with an nice Lagrange hit. Now, what is omega? So and that means every qubit needs a frequency. And actually, I think that's probably true. If anyone can give me an example of a qubit that doesn't have a rest mass, uh, it's a photon, and if it has a photon, it has a frequency. So um, if it has a rest mass, there's a natural, very, very high frequency, you know, un unmeasurably high for an electron, 10 to the, what is it, 10 to the 21 hertz or something for the Compton frequency. But there is a frequency for everything. And it, I want it to be big. I want it to be so high that you can't see the small oscillations. That's, that's kind of important. Um, the other weird thing about harmonic oscillators, if you used to think about quantum mechanics, is that Q is not a state. It's not a complete state, right? You guys know about harmonic oscillators. You know that the initial position of the harmonic oscillator is not a description of the oscillator. You need this initial velocity. So um, we're going to need P's as well as Q's. We're going to need to know the first derivative of Q to really define, well, wait, what state is this harmonic oscillator? Um, now, these Qs are matrices, that means there are four components. So Q has four components, P has four components. There's my eight real numbers. That's, that's why we need eight real numbers. You're not gonna see omega for most of this talk. I'm gonna set it to one and imagine all the time scales are, are much bigger. Many, many cycles of our, our qubit are happening on, on everywhere, on every, everything we can see. <clears throat> Okay, so there's, there's a pretty simple ontology. The ontology here is that at the beginning of this wire, we have uh, values of Q and P. Those values of Q and P determine what Q is everywhere uh, as a function of time, if you know the frequency, and nothing, nothing exciting is happening on this wire here. Um, now, the one complication is that you don't actually know how long this wire is on the scale of omega, because remember, omega is, is enormous on the scale of the fate. So by the time you get to your final gate, there is this additional hidden variable of you don't actually know what the phase is at that point. And so if you really wanted to carefully transform this, this phase usually doesn't matter, but if you really want to know the phase, you would have to transform on a Y or something like this. And then phi would be a hidden variable, because right? Because imagine it's an electron oscillating at the Compton frequency, at 10 to the 21 hertz, you have no idea uh, how many cycles that is when it gets to the next the next game. So that's a that's a hint. Okay, okay, let, let me ask yeah. you. I didn't quite follow the, the eight real numbers. Yes. Are these, Let's Q's, talk about these Q's and P's live in one dimension, two dimensions, three that, dimensions? This Q is a two by two matrix that is of that form I described. So it has an identity part, an I sigma X part, an I sigma Y part, and an I sigma Z part. Each of those four parts has one real number <clears throat> associated with it. So there's four, <clears throat> four real numbers. Or think if you know about quaternions, right? Quaternions have four real numbers to describe it. So if Q, think of Q as a quaternion, it's four real numbers. P is also four real numbers. So that's that's why I'm saying there are eight real numbers living on this on this part. Uh, okay, so th that's that clarifies that. And, and you say the omega is known but very, very large. 
it's known to be very, very large, and I'm basically going to set it to one for most of the stuff uh, coming up. Um, well, is it known? I mean, it's not known exactly. Well, how whether omega is a hidden variable or phi is a hidden variable probably doesn't matter. Uh, probably is equivalent. Um, but uh, I guess to the extent you know the mass, then you know omega. If that, if I'm right about what omega is, if omega is a constant frequency. So do you average over phi then? Or? Uh, no, okay. Let, let's uh, hold, on, hold off what we do with the hidden variables okay. is okay. coming up. Okay. Uh, when you look at the harmonic oscillator, of course, there's a conserved energy. And so, so we have a conserved scalar. It's um, basically the magnitude of Q squared plus P squared uh, is something like an energy of this qubit. Whether it really is an energy, we'll have to see. Um, but the, there's another very, very, very interesting uh, conserved quantity it is not a function of time. It's not a function of phi. It's constant on this wire. It's this particular combination. You take the Hermitian conjugate of P, you multiply it by Q, and it turns out the time behavior of each of these cancels because of the conjugate. And then you take the imaginary part of that. And it's conserved. It's a three vector. And it's a lot like angular momentum. In fact, pretty much that's where I'm going to get my, my uh, spin states. Or if, well, if you think of the qubit as a, as a spinning particle, that's where the the spin space is going to be, is going to reside in that, that piece. <clears throat> okay, so what about a gate? Uh, here, suppose I'm right. Suppose this is the spin state. Uh, this these three. This is only three variables, right? It's not the whole story. If Q and P are eight real numbers. This is only three real numbers. So, um, but nevertheless, if that corresponds to my spin state, I want a story that is going to rotate. That's what a single cubic gate does is it rotates this uh, around some chosen axis. And I want a Lagrangian formalism. So it's got to be of this form. This is my harmonic oscillator Lagrangian. And I've got to add some simple interaction term that will, I can control this qubit, right? That's what qubit, a single qubit gates do. What sort of control do I have? Well, I have control the rotation axis and I control the rotation rate. And you can uh, encode both of these controllable values in uh, my parameter B, which is just another quaternion or matrix, but it's purely imaginary. There's no real part. So there are only three values in here. That's the axis, is the, well, the direction of the axis, and the magnitude is the rotation rate. So I have this control on my qubit. How do I put that in my Lagrangian? It turns out this works. All you got to do is have this be my interaction term. So my, my control here of B Think of it as a magnetic field if you want for a spin state is interacting with my hidden my ontology here you take that you plug it in here and you find the classical equations of motion and it works uh, here is uh, a visualization of five different states starting on so okay what i plotted here i guess first thing i gotta do is give a shout out to west boyd here who is a professional programmer who is interested in this research and has offered uh free of charge to do a bunch of simulations and visualizations of all this. And so um, on all the cool pictures you see uh, and the coding is all, all uh, done by him. Uh, so thank you, Wes. Uh, and he got me going on this again after many years of hiatus by uh, uh, thinking about what, what we could work on together. Okay, so what, what am I plotting here? I'm basically plotting the three dimensions of this quantity, right? This is like a three vector. Uh, it is a three vector, whereas the imaginary part is these three components. And I plot it out. And I start with some initial states. <clears throat> and I turn on, uh, in this case, we turned on a value of B that was aligned in the Z direction. And uh, we turn on basically a huge, if you think of it as a magnetic field, it's enormous. It's crazy. The, the, the frequency associated with it is only a 40th of the Compton frequency. And so that's why you can see these little spirals here. As soon as B gets down to some reasonable value, these disappear. And, and it just looks like a nice straight line. Uh, but it, it works. It basically, we turn on uh, our B for a certain amount of time and then turn it off again. And no matter where your state starts on the, on the thing of this as a block sphere, it rotates 90 degrees in this case around the sphere because we ran B for just the right amount of time. It doesn't matter whether it starts up here or starts here or starts here. It always rotates by exactly the right amount. Um, so this, this would be like a gate where you would rotate uh, what the square root of uh, of a poly Z gate, right? If you just rotate 
around um, halfway to a Z gate. Um, that, that is how you would implement this gate. <clears throat> so it works on a continuous ontological level. It does what you expect it to do. <clears throat> but that's too complicated. We don't want to have to run a simulation every time we put something through a single qubit gate. So then you integrate up the effect and you say, well, we don't care about the story to get there. We just care about the end result. <clears throat> um, and we know how to do it, right? There is a two by two matrix for every single, um, every uh, single qubit gate. And I mentioned that we can turn this into a quaternion just by phasing it properly. So we just choose the global phase. And then it's as simple as this. You take Q and you take P and you discreetly transform them, done. And so that's the effect of this gate. It's, it's no more complicated than it would be for ordinary quantum mechanics, except for the fact that the Qs and Ps are more complicated, but it's, it's done. That's your single cubic transformation. You can see here, putting them together, what happens to the combination P dagger Q is it looks a lot like the transformation of the density matrix, right? Um, so um, now density matrix is not a quaternion, but uh, what it motivates is the map to the quantum state is this. The, um, this quantity rotates properly under a single qubit operation. We don't know anything about the, the real part, so that's a hidden variable. But we know that this is kind of like the, blocks, the block ball uh, vector. And uh, if you just add a negative i, that doesn't change the success of this equation. So um, there's uh, my initial guess, is that this is the block ball vector of the regular quantum state. There is not the whole story. There's five more hidden variables hiding in here, but it works exactly as advertised for single cubic gate. Okay, I just saw a question come in and I didn't read it, but what was it? Oh yes, yeah, so a copy of the slides. Absolutely, for sure. <clears throat> okay, that's, uh, that's the easy part. Now we gotta do two cubic gate. That's obviously the hard one because that's the one that generates entanglement. And in my story, there is no magic connection between two qubits on different wires. So, um, <clears throat> What is uh, the most simple uh, continuous two qubit interaction in real life that you bring like two electrons together? What do they do? They have this uh, basically spin spin coupling, they have this exchange force. And if you run it, if you put two electrons near each other for a certain amount of time, they swap. They swap their quantum states. If you only let them interact for half that amount of time, you get a root swap gate, which happens to be an entangling gate. It happens to be a um, a universal gate. If I can get the root swap gate working, I can get any two qubit gate working because you can build any two qubit gate. In fact, any any gate, right? Once you, once I have a single qubit gate and one universal two qubit gate, I'm done. That's game over. So I just need to get this root swap working, and I got it. All. <clears throat> so that's the goal. I want to get a root swap gate working. And again, I want to couple now two. Uh, qubits together, right? Q1 and Q2, because we got two of them now. And I, they need some interaction Lagrangian. And I want it to, uh, what's my, my controllable parameter? It's just a scalar now. It's just what's the strength of my coupling in, the, in this old school Hamiltonian here. Um, I have some control over alpha. I can turn it on, turn it off by bringing these qubits together. Um, and What's the very, very simplest possible interaction Lagrangian you could dream up? It's something like this, right? It's got to have a Q2 in it. It's got to have a Q1 in it. And it's got to have an alpha in it. And it's got to be real because it's a Lagrangian. And that, this works. I mean, there are a bunch of other cases that work too. But like the very simplest thing you can come up with actually works. Uh, what do I mean by it works? It swaps. So here, uh, this is another one of Wes's... Uh, uh, simulations and and I, I added these ugly arrows. He didn't do that. So the idea here is why I have initial spin constraint. I say this is a spin x. So in other words, we aligned this initial these three uh, variables to be in the x direction. Uh, that's for qubit one. Qubit two, the initial constraint is y. So I have it pointing in the y direction. Um, then we we solve the equations of motion from that Lagrangian, and we run the simulation. And guess what? After a certain amount of time, the one that was at x goes to y, and the one that was at y 
goes to X. Um, now you see there are other, other cases here. Well, I'll show you a whole bunch of other cases on the next slide. These are four different runs with random and initial hidden variables. They're not all the same, right? Only these three are the same. The other, the other five, actually four of them are random. And of, uh, only three of them are random because I put a constraint here that there's no energy transfer between the qubits. And let me show you what happens if I, I show you more of these. So this is a whole bunch of cases run where there's no energy exchange between the qubits. And you can see they sort of form this plane here inside the block, uh, the block ball. Um, if you don't constrain that they can't exchange energy, you still get a swap. It still works. So whatever starts here will end up here and vice versa. And this works for any two initial variables. It's not just these two special cases. Um, so the swap works great, but I don't, I don't care about the swap really. I mean, that's a good sign I'm on the right track, but what I want is the root swap. And this is about how far I got six, seven years ago before I, um, I gave up because the root swap is, it's a mess. At the halfway point, there's supposed to be a root swap. There's no rhyme or reason to uh, what's going on. Where even if you constrain, there's no energy transfer. It's even more of a mess at the halfway point here. Um, it's very, very, what's happening at the halfway point is extremely sensitive to the initial choice of hidden variables, Q1 and Q2. So different hidden variables will give us different, different uh, Let me ask you yes. a question. So, 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 so you have this, now this two qubit operation, uh -huh. but you're only showing one ball. So what happened to the other ball? There should be uh, two both balls. are overlaid here. So the red is one ball and the blue is the other ball, but they're overlaid. So one of them is here, I showed on the previous one. The blue, is plotted on this. This is the first qubit, and the red is, is so it's different variables, but plotted on the same sphere. Yeah, uh, we could have plotted on two different spheres, um, but that's that's. What we did. By the way, the fact that there are additional hidden variables means that even if they do get entangled and you separate them, they still can have correlations in not in these three hidden variables. And they're not hidden, you know them, but the other five is where the correlations are. So you can maintain correlations between separated things if, if you have some hidden variables. Okay, the discrete version of this, we can analytically solve this and prove that it swaps. This is it. If you just want to skip over all the simulation and just say, okay, what happens if I put this through a root swap? According to this Lagrangian, it's simply this, this sort of mixing of Q and P. And you can analytically show what would happen to your spin state um, if you do this weird scrambling of, of the Q's and P's of both qubits, you turn out you get this quantity. Now, the problem is this is what quantum mechanics predicts. Quantum mechanics predicts this. If I have um, separable inputs, then the block, the block ball vector of one of my qubits should become half of that one plus half the other one. Oh, that looks good. Look, half of this one, that's, that's V1, plus half of that one. Okay, that's good. Plus this cross product, so you, you get a, you, in fact, in that previous one, you get a K term that should come out. And I, in my hidden variable model, get this. And I bang my head about against this for a year or two, trying to like, okay, all I gotta do is get these guys talking to each other and, um, and I'm done. I have to root swap it, but I never could get it to work. Uh, sometimes these are the same, but usually they're not, and I couldn't figure out a rule to get, get it to work. And I knew it had to be a retrocausal rule, right? I knew there had to be some kind of constraint on what was gonna happen next that would constrain the hidden variables that would make this work, but I couldn't figure it out. And finally, I just, I set it aside for, for a number of years and have only recently come back to it. So now I've gotten up to, to where the new, new results start. So maybe another another good time for a pause here. Uh, I don't even know how much time I have. What time is it? Oh no, I only have 20 minutes. <sighs> okay, I'm not gonna take any questions. I gotta press up. <laughs> okay. So first new thing uh, I tried was looking at just the part of the action that was the part due to the interaction of the part of the garage, right? The, the action is normally the integral of LDT but I just looked at the integral of this interaction part and I started minimizing it and it looked really good. Uh, it looked like, oh, this is making those two terms look similar. If for whatever reason, nature is minimizing this part of the action, it's, 
is working pretty well. But then, you know, I started looking at more, well, it's worked pretty well, but it doesn't work great. It's not always just right. And I, I finally noticed this. <clears throat> I started adjusting this hidden variable, this, the real part of this thing. Now, remember the imaginary part is the spin state, the real part, who knows what that is. And I noticed that when it was, um, when I adjusted it to make this not only minimize, but also negative pi over two, um, that suddenly those two terms became equal. I suddenly got the block all result from quantum mechanics at this, at this sort of very interesting number. Um, and I'm still not quite sure what this means. I mean, a lot of people, obviously you know about minimizing the action. Maybe you've heard about action quantization, which I'll talk about in a moment, but I, has anyone actually done both at once? I mean, it only works if you do both at once. It has to be minimized and it has to be this particular value. Um, and so, I mean, I've said this before that the action, things you can do with the action are sort of criminally underexplored. People do certain things with the action because that's what people will always know with the action. Uh, there's room for creativity with what you do with the action. So here's, here's an idea. What if you have to quantize it and minimize it together? So let's, let's go down this road and see, uh, see what we can get. Now, uh, you may have noticed the units are totally wrong. The action should not be unitless. But of course, I've, I've set my omega to one. So I, gotta, I wanna bring units back in. I wanna get an H bar in here. And so one, um, one tempting way to reintroduce the units is just to say, oh, well, I said my omega is mc squared or H bar, or the energy over H bar or something. Um, but you have to stop and think, well, wait, you can't just bring an H bar for free. Uh, where does this come in in some sort of fundamental model? So you go way back to where it first started coming in to our models. Pre, uh, this is called the old quantum theory, you know, pre Schrodinger equation. And uh, Bohr, you know, you probably know about the Bohr model, right? But it, maybe you don't know the generalization of that by someone called Wilson that works um, in many, many cases. Is what you do is you get the Hamiltonian in these particular coordinates called action angle form. And uh, then you quantize this thing called the action coordinate in units of, of well, in this case, h bar or h, depending on whether you have the angle in there, uh, unitless or not. Um, and you, presto, they discovered the, the energy got quantized when you did this. And I've always really liked this action quantization because it's an all at one story. If you think about it, even the original Bohr model was an all at one story. The, act, the angular momentum had to be this value. Um, so I'm like, well, why don't we just try the old quantum theory on my hidden variable model? And boom, boom, boom. This is, uh, I'm very excited about this. So we have basically, we canonically transform my interaction Hamiltonian into action angle coordinates. And the, now what is omega? Now the omega in action angle coordinates is the frequency at which the system gets back to where it started. So it's, um, it's not really the swap frequency, but it's that, that story. So as you turn alpha down, it takes longer to swap, right? The coupling small. And it turns out that in these units, omega swap basically is alpha. And so now the alpha cancels. And quantizing, it, the, using the rules from the old quantum theory, get you the, this quantization rule that I discovered. Um, it gets you the right answer. So somehow applying the old quantum theory to my <coughs> hidden variable model gets um, the right angular momentum. Uh, well, no, it gets the right root swap behavior. Uh, in the discrete form, basically it's this quantization condition somehow works. Um, and this is, it turns out, an adiabatic invariant. So these things that are quantizing the old quantum theory, if you're not familiar with it, are these things that are constant and they're constant even if there's a change in in the uh, a small change in the system this is sort of resist that change it's called an adiabatic invariant and it is what was quantized in the old quantum theory there is an adiabatic invariant here and when i quantize this i get my two qubit gate working um, so this is really interesting what it all means i haven't quite processed but obviously what I want to check with it is, is it modular? Can I build a CNOT gate? Um, I go to Wikipedia and I see exactly how to build a CNOT gate out of my root swaps. This is a root swap and this is a root swap. These are all single qubit gates. The, this 
first one and the last three aren't really that interesting. They're just rotating the output so it matches a root swap. The heart of the root swap, I'm sorry, the heart of the C naught is a root swap followed by a single qubit transformation on this, uh, on this qubit only, followed by another root swap. So it's these three middle ones are, are the way you build a C naught. So I, I take my working root swap and I like, well, does it work? Does it, does it build a C naught? And sometimes it works, but sometimes it doesn't. Again, it was like before that, well, there's some hidden variables where it gives me just what a C naught would predict and other ones not. But now I know what to look for. Uh, are there special values on the single qubit gate? And of course there must be, if you think about it, the logic I just used, I applied the old quantum theory to my two qubit gate. I never went back and applied it to my one qubit gate. So now let's go back to the one qubit gate and apply this old quantum theory to that one. And guess what? Uh, what you end up quantizing, you can kind of see how this is going to work. B is, remember, think of this as like a mag in the magnetic field in the Z direction, okay? Um, if I end up quantizing this somehow, what is the real part of this? Well, the real part of uh, this, um, well, you only get a real part if, if B is in the, say, I sigma Z direction, is if this is also in the I sigma Z direction. So the real part is entirely dependent on the B directed component of my spin state. And this should be ringing lots of bells of people because when you turn on a magnetic field, say to a spin, to a, a spin state, what do you quantize? You quantize that component, not the other two, right? You quantize the one you're looking at. You apply the old quantum theory to my invariable model and boom, you end up quantizing your preparation. If you look in the Z direction, you quantize the spin component in the Z direction. You look in the X direction, the old quantum theory quantizes the component you look at in the X direction. And then when you measure, it does the same thing. Um, so I'm, this is all like within the last couple of weeks, this has all come together. I'm very excited about it. Uh, now you may say, wait a second, the old quantum result has the wrong answer because they looked at quantization of angular momentum. In fact, that was their starting point and they got H bar and I'm supposed to get H bar over two, right? When you use the old quantum theory on angular momentum of a particle going around a sphere, you, uh, you get, it has to be quantized in units of H bar. But that's not my ontology. My ontology is Q's and P's. Uh, let's think about what the Q's and P's are doing. When, when the combination P, Q goes back to where it started, I mean, one cycle around the block sphere, What's actually happening on the, on the ontological level is that Q is, is flipping to negative Q and P is flipping to negative P. It's, it's one half cycle of Q and, what, and one half cycle of P gives you a full cycle of the angular momentum. And so the true frequency is actually only half as big as what you think it is. You watch it go around the block sphere, it has to go around twice before the Qs and Ps are actually back to where they start. And look, if omega is half what you think it is and you use the exactly the same quantization rule, then your angular momentum is half of what you thought it was too. You get the H bar over two for free. Um, all you have to do is look and see what, what is the real frequency of my underlying system. And boom, you get uh, H bar over two for your angular momentum. Of in the, only in the component that you're measuring. <laughs> So now I have to revisit everything, right? Because that's not where I started. I started assuming that this matched the known quantum state, but that's not true anymore. If this is right, the, the known quantum state is not uh, correct. Suppose I prepare in the Z basis. Uh, I can't say this is I sigma Z. I can say is that component is quantized, but the rest components are unconstrained. The other three components are hidden. Uh, similarly, when I measure it, let's say I measure it in the theta basis, uh, that applying the old quantum theory there says this term has to be quantized, but the other components are hidden. Uh, and you ask, well, wait, what solution? The solve is all at once, right? This is a, an all at once retrocausal model. What solution on this wire will have a quantized Z component and a quantized theta component? And um, you guys, this is the place to come to talk about this solution 
because anyone familiar with two-state vector formalism knows how this works. If you say, okay, here's my block sphere, my prepar preparation is only quantizing this component, and you know it has to live on this plane. And then if you say my measurement quantizes that component, I know it has to live on this plane. What's my ontology? It's the same thing as, as your weak values you get from a pre and post selected uh, ensemble. Um, that's the solution on, on the wire. Um, now, actually, there are more solutions because there's this third dimension here. I could come in or out of the board as well, and I would also have perfectly valid solutions. But remember, I'm minimizing these quantities, and I think I need to put all this together, but I think I'm going to end up minimizing this quantity and forcing it to be exactly this. As my, uh, my, the ontology that lives on the wire, if you measure uh, Z and then theta, is basically this purple vector is you know, in this, imagine this weird space, this imaginary P dagger Q space, this purple vector is, is what's really there. It doesn't have to be normalized, right? Where the probabilities come in, probabilities come in by comparing two things. Like, oh wait, there's another possible outcome, is this outcome. And I, I know the blue uh, result is more probable than the purple result. And then you can say, well, why might that be? And you can try to dream up rules that give you the right probability distribution of the Born rule. And it turns out that you use a very, very simple rule in this case. Uh, if your global prior was that I expect my imaginary P dagger Q uh, to be uh, the probability of it to scale like one over its magnitude squared, you actually get the Born rule. Boom. Uh, this is basically equivalent to the Shulman model, Nathan. I think this is my new Shulman model. This is, this is my new single qubit model that I'm going to be working on from here on out. Uh, the old single qubit retrocausal model, uh, I think we has run, run its course. This one is the one I'm excited about and uh, what I want everyone to see. Okay, so I'm about done here. What do I want to do next? Obviously, uh, if I'm right about this, I have an ontology. Finally, that maybe works for these, the dream I have here. And I have the basic rules, which is a basically some version of the old quantum theory, possibly combined with a minimization, extremization of those quantized values. Um, so there's not too much more space to explore here. Once we get the basic rules, um, I have to go back and revisit the two qubit gates, which I was all thinking before I was, I was thinking about the, the one qubit gate properly. Now I have to go back and redo these, but I'm pretty confident something's going to work because I already checked that it worked for basically what you know about the system. Now I'm going to add more hidden variables, but I, I'm pretty sure these are still going to work. <clears throat> if it does work, I need to get up to three qubits, right? And then, you know, get to GHZ, get to some other modular gates. And uh, if that works, we're done because we can build up any quantum state from one to cubic gates. And at that point, um, there will be a hidden variable model for any quantum state, not just special quantum states. And um, if there's a way to get probabilities out of the whole thing, maybe uh, some version of what I just showed you for the single qubit, um, then it's, it's all over, but the shouting. Well, decades, decades of shouting, but um, that's the dream. The dream is uh, we're going to get back to space time and get things on the qubits and uh, I could I could use some help. So anyone interested, let's uh, let's talk. <clears throat> um, I'll just leave you with this thought that there's no no go theorem that says this can't work if you're willing to let the future gates constrain the story and just imagine uh, the revolution that would occur if it did work. And there was an alternative story to the two to the end giant Hilbert space where things just lived where we know, where we know they live on on the wires. Thanks. Thank you, Ken. Questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It seems to me that you, like Q and P can have quite arbitrary values. So uh, I was wondering how do you constrain the like the normalization of the qubit 
Okay. Yeah, so the first way I can get normalization is the old quantum theory. You know, put, put a quantization on something. And there's not other things. So you got a bunch of other hidden variables. The standard way you do a class with hidden variables in classical mechanics is you start at the beginning and you put an initial just probability distribution over what you think they start at and you run it. That is not what you do here. You do not give it an initial probability distribution. Because the whole idea is the probabilities are global, right? You look at the whole story. I mean, the dream is that you find the probability space out of the solution space. You say, oh, with, with this outcome, there are n solutions. And with this outcome, there are two n solutions. And so you expect it to be twice as probable. That's, that's like the best case scenario. Um, you get, like, that's how you get poker problems, right? You look at the distribution of how many hands there are, flushes versus straights. Um, I would love that kind of story to, yeah, to constrain. And then at the, if that's the case, you may never know the hidden variable. You just may know there's all these solutions that could happen on this wire or on the circuit. Um, but the space of that solution, so you say one of them happens. It'd be like classical statin, right? You have all these um, possible configurations of air molecules in this room and that space gives you information. One of them is real, right? But you never know which one. It, it might end up being real. Um, the, the ball pictures that you're showing that's similar to the block sphere. Right, and the idea is uh, it maps to the block sphere in that um, in that this this quantity in my from constructed from my ontological hidden variables acts like uh, a vector on the block sphere would, would act. It rotates properly. Yeah, that's not the other one. The ball. Yeah, what's well, the same? It's the same ball. This is yeah. this is West didn't make this one, so it looks ugly. <laughs> this is uh, it's the same sphere. Uh, these ones are, um, uh, so yeah. You have your, um, so on these eight real numbers, three of them tell you where you are on the sphere, and oh. five in variables. Five of them are not plot, right. Uh, but they don't affect the position, right? They only affect the gate. <clears throat> is that? Um, well, that's the problem. The problem is they do affect things. I mean, that was kind of the, the problem here, is that the details of which, what they, the other hidden variables are, actually end up messing up right. what I want to get. And right. so they do matter, but now you have to constrain them. You have to say, okay, uh, those hidden variables are constrained by something. Are they constrained by this old quantum theory action quantization story? If so, then they have to be these values. Um, if, if maybe there's some other rule that will work better, I don't know. Um, but that's the idea. The idea is that the other hidden variables are constrained by nature somehow. Uh, so in the, in the usual block sphere, the sort of distance from the center gives you an idea of purity of your state and so on and so forth. Right? Yes. Your, your sort of model doesn't have any of that. Well, great question though, because if I put on, um, this actually, you can see here, it goes inside the sphere. Yeah. It goes inside the sphere. It goes in you can now get all the way to the center of the sphere. And in fact, you get to the center of the sphere for maximally entangled states. So what happens then? Then you have no information. Well, you know that this imaginary part of P dagger Q, all, they all three of the moles are zero. What's left? What's left is Q itself. Q itself, um, okay, if you get to ever get to that solution, uh, the Harmonic oscillator is basically oscillating, it's hard to think of a threes here, but it's oscillating on a line, with a line in, in four dimensions. Um, but there are four different orthogonal states that Q can oscillate. It can oscillate in the real axis, the I axis, the J axis, and the K axis. And of course, there are four orthogonally different maximum things. So the, the math works. And the <coughs> relationship between the two is the product of the two Qs, Q1, Q2. If you rotate one of the spheres, that rotates the product, right? Because you multiply U on one side or on the other side. And it works just like you expect. So if I did get to the middle, that's OK, because I'm a maximum entangled state, but that's encoded in the Qs. And if you just if you separate them and rotate one, uh, the, the math works that that's exactly, oh, that's exactly how a maximum angle state should transform if you separate it and rotate one of them. It works exactly right. And then you can bring them back together. And uh, that's, that's the dream. The dream is that these maximum angle states aren't in contact. They're just correlated. And you bring them back together and you can see them. 
But yeah, you can go all the way to the center of this block. Or it's not really a log fair. It's kind of like one. <clears throat> Any other questions? Can you mention uh, in the previous or latter block sphere plot about something about probability? Yes. The, the probability seems to have not entered anywhere into this discussion. No, no, that's going to be the so, last piece. So, so where you start throwing a probability, where does probability enter well, the okay. So uh, all I know experimentally, like uh, blue arrows are certain uh, you know, sine squared theta over two more probable than the purple arrows. Okay. So I know the experimental results. I know what I'm trying to get. And right. then you say, okay, well, how, how could I explain that? And well, it could explain that if it turns out the probability of these arrows was proportional to one over the square of the length of the arrow. Boom, I get, you, I, you can actually see, see when theta over two comes in, right? This is, if that's theta over two, and say you normalize your block sphere radius, this turns into one over uh, cosine theta over two, and you can see just how you would get a, uh, a Bohr rule sort of out of the length of these vectors. I don't know, that's probably not the right rule, but that's the sort of thing I'm looking for. I'm looking for like, okay, I know the answer, what is my global prior on these hidden variables that are going to give me the right answer? Yeah. Um, and so a lot, a lot of what I do is, yeah, look for, for Born rules. In, uh, but presumably, if you had the right hidden variable model, it would fall, fall out of this. Uh, no, because the hidden variable is just the ontology. The, the, you need is a prior on, well, what do I expect those hidden variables to be given no other information? Given that prior, then you get a problem. Um, you know, I can straighten them and see what's left. But without a prior, uh, I don't know if you can get a probability. But, and you have to guess the prior. But fortunately, we know the answer. So I can test, does this give me the right probabilities? Oh, no, it doesn't work. It's the wrong rule. Um, yeah. Justin? Yeah, I have a related question. So this V here, for example, you said that's the solution that satisfies the two boundary conditions. Right. So that being the conserved quantity over the whole wire. And it is conserved over the whole wire, right? Right from the beginning. Right. But uh, what are the free parameters that can be like probabilized? Like you don't know the hidden parameters such that that thing's kind of. Well, it's the other five. So uh, you know this combination, uh, the imaginary P dagger Q, that's three numbers, but they're eight real numbers. So the other five numbers are all hidden variables. And if you put a distribution over randomness, like subjective randomness over those five, do you get a net probability of? Um, so. Like what's the probability of the total conserved okay, quantity being that? Randomness given what measure? I mean, that's the, what I mean by yeah. global prime. What's your measure of? Yeah, so I'm saying this, suppose you have a uniform measure on each of those individual five parameters, but only some subset of the uniform measure will give you exactly this constrained Okay. Yeah, I, I don't think it was, it's going to be a different measure for each of the parameters. I mean, the way I think about these things is they live on like no, 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 seven but, spheres. But, but that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you start with just a uniform measure over all the parameters. Then when you apply the boundary conditions, you partition the set of parameters that are allowed to give that constraint. That measure of that subset divided by the measure of all possible random variables gives you a ratio, which is a probability. Is that the Born rule? I because don't think that will work because if you, if, um, okay, well, there's, there's more, there's other constraints. There's constraints of the total energy of this oscillator. Right. Um, so there's a set so, of constraints right. that need to be set. But I do think, I, I think that is basically what we want. We want exactly what you described, that if you have all the right constraints and you define your, your smooth measure properly, that the Born rule will fall off of exactly as you described. That's the dream. So like, the, like the ergodic hypothesis. Exactly. Right. right. But it's an all one story. It's not like the initial, you don't look at the initial invariants. Yeah, You've got to look at the nice. history. Yeah. But, but if, if, if that's the right thing to do, then what you can do is just start with what is your parameter space. There's going to be a R measure over that that okay. satisfies all the correct symmetries. And make that just your uniform unknown measure. So I don't know anything about it. That's oh. a uniform measure. Now you apply boundary conditions, it's gonna constrain yeah. the parameter space. So you're gonna get now a ratio of what is the constrained heart measure versus the total heart measure. That's, that's the goal. That's a probability, right. So that's... Does it give you that one over B squared? Uh, it might. Oh, well maybe, I mean, if actually, if you put the energy constraint on, I think it might, um, but. So just, just as we thought. For yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, good, good, good. Um, so, I mean, 
I won't really believe any probability rule until I get correlation probabilities in two qubit, two qubit cases. Uh, it's easy, as, as we know, to find one qubit stories. It's the two qubit stories that are, are few and far between. But since you have a very well-defined ontology with these fixed number of parameters, it seems like that would be the natural thing to try. To say, well, why do I get probabilities at all? It's only because certain configurations could lead to this conserved quantity out of all the possible configurations. That, that That's exactly the story I want. I want, I mean, that's why, why everyone used to look at quantum probabilities and say there must be hidden variables, right? Uh, because that's where probabilities come from, is when you don't know something. Uh, this modern story that we know everything and there's still probabilities is a really weird concept. Um, that's why I'm thinking epistemically. Yeah, yeah. Where all the possibilities, I don't know them. That's, that's your story. I, I know I'm among friends here. Yes, this is good. Uh, <clears throat> all right, any uh, Zoomers want to ask a question? No, the Zoomers are all. all well, quiet. It, it, it takes them a moment to unmute. Uh, give, it, give it a moment. So, Ken, uh, can you um, describe uh, how far you can take this in terms of uh, reproducing the uh, known probabilities for two qubit uh, systems? So, I mean, the maximally entangled ones are ones that we're usually used to reproducing, but what about partially entangled or? Yeah, so in my five-year hiatus, not working on this, I spent a lot of time, as you know, working on partial models of partially entangled systems, other models, and have some success there. So I basically had two tracks to get there. One is the one I just described, take this old quantum rule. Now that I understand a one qubit state, go back to the two qubit state, see what comes out. Maybe it'll work. But I also, in my back pocket, have a bunch of other results of partially entangled states, uh, thinking about photons as classical electromagnetic waves. Um, that are working really well. So I have a couple paths to getting partially entangled states. What Nathan's alluding to here is there is no good retrocausal model yet for partially entangled states. Although you actually have some partial results for GHZ now, right? So- um, Yeah, but only for the fully entangled. Oh, okay, okay. Well, yeah, so there is no yet good retrocausal partially entangled state model, but I expect that to fall within a year. I expect uh, we'll get the first one in a year. Oh, wait, another another question is coming on chat. Oh, slides. Yes, I will send the slides. Thanks for for my. Okay. Why don't we thank uh, Ken again and uh, in the seminar? Thanks everyone for coming. <laughs>